Chinese New Year sees the largest annual mass migration of people on the planet. When a sixth of the world's population travels home to celebrate with their families. We've been all over China, exploring how this country experiences the most important festival in its calendar. We'll uncover this extraordinary annual event and experience the richness of Chinese culture. From how families prepare for festivities to the celebrations on the day itself. In this episode, we'll be focusing on the run-up to New Year. Happy New Year. Come by. Exploring how rural China used to celebrate New Year. And witnessing the world's largest motorbike migration. Let's see if we can cut the kanji. Come here, Pai Choi. Happy New Year. The Chinese New Year celebration is also known as the Spring Festival. Lasting 15 days, it's the main holiday of the Chinese calendar. The start of the festival lands on a different day in January or February each year, as the date is decided by the lunar calendar. In modern China, many people who may have moved away from home in search of work will have to travel great distances to be reunited with their loved ones across the length and breadth of this huge and varied country. As well as having some of the fastest growing modern cities, the landscapes are truly diverse. They range from vast deserts to expansive grasslands, tropical jungles, and the highest mountain range in the world. China's written history dates back over 3,000 years and through the reigns of over 500 emperors. Its economy is the largest on Earth and it makes and exports more goods than anywhere else on the globe. Chinese food is as rich and varied as any on Earth, with thousands of dishes to choose from, all cooked in a variety of ways using a host of different ingredients grown right across this vast nation. And it's changing astonishingly fast. By 2030, it's estimated that one billion people will be living in Chinese cities, just like here in Beijing. Many of these new people flock into the cities were migrant workers in search of a better life for themselves and their families. And at Chinese New Year, the modern and the traditional are brought together as the Chinese prepare for a celebration even older than the Great Wall itself. But celebrating such an epic event puts enormous pressure on Chinese transport systems when a billion people need to travel across the country. The Chinese even have a word for it, Chunyun, the spring migration. China's capital, Beijing, has to cope with one of the biggest movements of people on Earth. Beijing is one of the most densely populated cities on the planet. Around 21 million people live and work here, but at Chinese New Year, millions flood out of the city and head to their hometowns across China. The total number of trips made by road in China in and around New Year is an eye-watering 3.2 billion, and a lot of them are made in this very city of Beijing. And like cabbies all over the world, my taxi driver, Mai Yung Chi, enjoys a good old moan about the city's traffic.
他就不会把车挪开，你把车挪开就完了，弄了两条车道。Managing this flow of vehicles takes a huge amount of technology. This state-of-the-art monitoring hub is the responsibility of Gon Son Lin. The traffic is very, very busy. It's busier than uh, Shanghai or Shenzhen because we have a really uh, big uh, road network. Very big job to moving all the persons to their hometown. The roads are monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Seven days. Every day we have to be here. And it's cabs, like the one I'm in, that provide the data needed to keep the traffic flowing. We have 67,000 uh, taxis in Beijing, and every one of them equipped GPS. Every 30 seconds, each taxi relays its position and speed back to the control room. This information helps to construct an overall picture of the city's traffic flow in real time. <laughs> the data can then be used to let drivers know where the hotspots are so they can try to avoid the jams. For those who want to travel further afield for Chinese New Year, there's another option. They fly. Across China, a staggering 54 million trips are by air during the festival. This is Beijing Capital Airport, and it is always busy, but during Spring Festival, this becomes the busiest airport in the world. As you can see, it feels like the whole country is on the move. During the New Year rush, almost 10 million people pass through this airport, mostly flying home to China. Li Tongyu lives in Surrey. She's preparing to fly to Beijing with her family. We haven't been spending Chinese New Year with my family back in China for about nine years now. Mary, my eldest daughter, was only three years old, and uh, little Harry not even born yet. So I think it will be a great opportunity for them to experience the whole thing. Oh, this is Hello. 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 I have one elder brother in Beijing, along with my parents, and uh, particularly at the Chinese New Year's celebrating time. It's the most time I miss them. Hello. Especially when your parents are not well, like my father been uh, struggling with uh, Parkinson, and uh, it has been quite difficult. My father always miss me, especially during the Chinese New Year. So this time, I think, will make him extremely happy. Here's me, and we did like the long hair. In traditional Chinese family, having a family portrait is very important. So this year, I'm going to give my father a surprise. We are going to have the children draw a portrait, and uh, that will be a big surprise for them. It will be wonderful. Meanwhile, over 250 million rail journeys are made across China during the festival. Last year, 5.6 million rail tickets were sold in a single day. One of the busiest stations in the country is Beijing West. In the fortnight leading up to New Year's Eve, over 3 million people will pass through these ticket barriers to get a train from here. That's over 200,000 people a day. For some, the days they take off now are the only holiday they get all year so they're prepared to travel a long way for a long time to get home. He's got a 16-hour journey. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. He's got to get on a train for 31 hours. With so many people on the move, things can get complicated, especially when the weather intervenes. This year, Chinese television reported queues of up to 100,000 people at Guangdong train station when heavy snow caused delays. 
To keep everything running smoothly requires precision organization. Compared to the bustle outside, the Railway Bureau Control Center is an oasis of calm. This place is incredible. It is huge. I feel like I'm in the control room of Apollo 13. And you can see that everyone is so focused and the concentration, I can feel the buzz in the room. Because I guess they have to. They are ultimately responsible for every train that passes through. In charge of keeping the system moving is Ye Kuang Kuang. We are here the largest rail train uh,然后呢,它就是控制和监控着咱们进出北京地区的所有的旅客列车,呃,货运列车。我看每个人看的这些图案都是很复杂,他们看些什么东西。这个不同的线条呢,代表着不同的含义。呃,您看到的就是
every new year in the heartland of industrial China, thousands upon thousands of motorcyclists brave the weather and take to the road, determined to make it home to their families. These workers are employed in the largest urban area in the world, Guangdong province in southern China, where many of them live the entire year. The factories that line this huge river delta employ migrants who have often come from villages hundreds of miles away. The journey home is long, cold and exhausting. Around the city of Jiaoqing, aid stations have been set up for the bikers to shake out their soaking ponchos and stop for food. We're at Shaoxiang Aid Station, which is one of several that runs inland from Shaoxing. Now, it's a bit of a bottleneck here, and more than 50,000 motorcycles will pass through on their way home for the festivities. I can't tell you, Kingy, how amazing it is to see so many bikes in one place. I'm all tickle pink with excitement. Yeah, Dave, bikes are an important form of transport in China. Planes and trains can be too expensive for people, so the humble bike is often the only way thousands of workers can get home. There's a whole team of volunteers helping here. One of them is Danny Chiao. Danny, what exactly is happening? In every station, we provide hot water, yes. ginger porridge. Right. Uh, ginger porridge. Ginger porridge. porridge. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And motorcycle repairmen, and all of them are free. We ride motorcycles a lot and the amount of times where we would have loved to be able to come in here for something to eat, something to drink, and something to have a look at the bike. Well, it's kind of a camaraderie that's going on as well, isn't it? it Everybody's is. going home for the big Chinese New Year's Eve. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what I think is a lovely, lovely touch. Over there, there's lovely heaters yeah. for people to warm their feet, because it is pretty miserable and cold. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Far and away, the busiest part of the pit stop is the food tent and the house speciality every day is ginger porridge. But there are no Scottish oats in here. Instead, it's rice. So, uh, interestingly enough, it's savoury with a little bit of pork in it. It's good. Yeah, it's heavy ginger. Fields, how many of these do you go through a day of these big pots of porridge? Uh, about ten. Ten? Oh, ten? Yes. Gosh. Wow. Well, we wanted to find out the secrets of such a popular porridge. So we followed our noses to the back streets of Shaoshang and to a volunteer known simply as Auntie Porridge. You are Auntie Porridge, the person who provides all that porridge Aww. at the aid station. But we, we've had, had your porridge, our congee. It's, it's good. It's Aww. so good. It's so good. Wow. How do you make it? I'm in my element, chopping up ginger, spring onion, radish and pork under the gaze of some keen critics. I've got to constantly stir now. I'm here for three days. Auntie? Auntie porridge? Oh, I know what went with. Uh, not with that one, with this one. OK. The pork is coated in corn flour and popped into the pot. I'll tell you what it's like. You know when you stir wallpaper paste when it goes really thick? It's like that sort of consistency. I think it's sometimes your food tastes like that. Go, Go away. <laughs> Ah, it's like that, is it? Well, the proof is in the pudding. Or should we say the porridge? It's time to find out what our fellow bikers make of our ginger porridge and to try out our best Mandarin and Cantonese. Kong Hee Pad Choi! Happy New Year! Oh, look at that! Some of these people have been on the road since 3 o'clock in the morning and this is the first thing we've had to eat. Ah, Kongi Pa Choi. Kongi Pa Choi. Well, it seems to be going down well with the connoisseurs. It is. Do you know what? I think Auntie Porridge has taught us well. Do you know what I mean? It's good great, isn't it? Many of the migrant travellers are young parents returning home to see their children, often for the first time in many months, like Leung Yung Sien and Lee Bingling. Ying Chen, do you have a family waiting at home? 
，一个女孩，一个男孩，已经大的有十七岁了，小的十五岁了。哦，对，心情非常激动，想感慨的围绕家里。家里有两个小孩。Young Chen, what do you do when you get home? 回家为吃顿饭，然后呃，正好你们又过来了，我邀请你们去我家做客，一起一起吃顿饭，好吧？哦，别。That would be an absolute honour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we want to take up Young Sien's kind offer, but there's one big problem. Would you believe it, Kingy? One of the greatest motorcycle happenings in the world, and we can't ride a motorcycle. Well, that's because we don't have a Chinese motorcycle license, and the laws are strictly enforced at this time of the year because there are so many motorcycles on the road. Anyway, I've got a surprise for you. What? A ride in the back of a Chinese police car, and it's not your first time, is it? How dare you! Because of the huge numbers of bikes on the road during Chinese New Year, the local police provide an escort. As the workers near their hometowns and villages, the flotilla breaks up. Yong Sien and Bing Lin are now on the familiar roads near their home. After hours of travelling, they return to the warm welcome of their family. <laughs> Like so many migrant workers, Young Sien has sacrificed family life to bring them all a better standard of living. And as night falls, we join them around the dinner table for one of the oldest traditions on earth. The international icebreaker of hospitality, food and great company. <laughs> Well, mate, that is what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, the feeling of joy around that table makes that journey worthwhile, and that's happening all over China. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Once they've made it back to their families, many people use this opportunity to spend time together. A huge variety of cultural activities are organized during the festival period. One of the biggest events is the Snow and Ice Festival, held in Harbin, the capital of Heilongjiang province. Visited by thousands of Chinese tourists, it's built from scratch to a new design every year. And Anstead travelled to Harbin to explore this icy city. In Harbin, the winter temperatures drop as low as minus 30 degrees centigrade. But for the people who live here, this frozen world is just a way of life. Tucked away in the frozen northeast of China, Harbin was originally a tiny rural settlement. Until the railways arrived. The Chinese Eastern Railway connected Eastern Siberia via Harbin to Russia. It transformed this city into the beating heart of commerce and industry in this region. and the Russian connection is everywhere. The people who built the railways and settled here were made of pretty strong stuff. Looking around, I'm the only one that's quite so kitted up for the cold. Even the kids here, they look hardier than me. The people here aren't just surviving, they've embraced the sub-zero temperatures. In fact, Five million people are happy to call Harbin their home. By far and away, the most extreme example of this city's passion for the cold is the local tradition of ice swimming.
With an average temperature of minus 13 degrees outside, this is a showcase for the strong physique and iron will of the Harbin locals. During the winter months, these brave swimmers, they head to the river to take a plunge in this special pool cut out of the ice. It's a truly local pastime. Okay. The river water is a painful one degree Celsius. Without these motors to keep the water constantly moving, it would simply freeze over. This isn't the type of pool you want to take a relaxing dip in. I mean, just for a second, if I take my glove off, put my whole hand in, I can assure you that is absolutely freezing. Some of the regulars have been coming here for over 20 years. <laughs> Mr. Yu, why do you do this? Stretches. Even if I was tempted to take the plunge, and I assure you I'm not, jumping into the water unacclimatised, I'd run the risk of a heart attack. What is going on? <laughs> it's bonkers. Incredibly, the average age here is 70. Ice swimming is more about resilience than, shall we say, graceful technique. <laughs> but this icy river isn't just for extreme sports. All the building materials for the festival at Harbin are taken from this spot to create the City of Ice. In just one week, 8,000 workers cut out the 180,000 cubic metres of ice needed. It's only when you get closer you realise just how thick this ice is. I mean, that's around 20 inches. This is a proper construction project on an industrial scale. For nearly 60 years, this humble patch of earth on the outskirts of town has been transformed into a frozen fantasy land. 125,000 tonnes of ice is cut, shifted and painstakingly crafted. In just three weeks, an entire city has emerged, and here it is in all its frosty glory. Every year, there is a different theme reflecting on a period of Chinese history. And this year, it's the Silk Road. The Silk Road was an ancient trade route linking China to the Mediterranean Sea. Dating from the second century BC, Chinese merchants used to use it to unite the East and the West. Looking back to the past has long been a part of Chinese culture. This is a Chinese tower. Inspired by the pavilion of Prince Tang, it's a classic Chinese design and it's built to represent the country where the Silk Road began. Now, over here in the distance, the Hagia Sophia of Istanbul. It's a Byzantine masterpiece in ice. Now, slightly off track, but over here in the distance, a nod to our Russian neighbours. This ice version of the cathedral from Moscow's Red Square by the Kremlin towers 34 metres high.
But typically for the people of Harbin, this festival goes from extreme beauty to extreme adrenaline. Take a look down there. It's 320 metres and you do about 10 metres a second, which puts it into Olympic sprinter territory. <laughs> and speaking of sprinters... <laughs> Here you are. Humble. We're going to have a race. What do you think? Well, I think you're going to come second, so prepare that silver medal. Uh, 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 don't so fast. I'm not losing this. Ready? OK, you say go. Three, two, one, go! <laughs> go on! But it's when the sun sets that this place becomes truly magical. It is this that makes Harbin world famous and brings in tourists from all over China. However, it all began with a simple ice lantern. Back in the 1960s, the people of Harbin couldn't afford traditional lanterns to celebrate New Year. So they froze water in buckets, put candles inside, and the ice festival was born. Using light as a symbol of celebration has continued through to the modern festival today. Almost every one of over 2,000 buildings here has its very own light display. The lighting design is almost as epic an endeavour as building the festival itself. The logistics involved in making this happen are staggering. The sheer scale of the operation means the festival needs 230,000 metres of electrical cables. That's 13.8 million individual lights. But creating such a vast electrical system demands meticulous attention to detail to withstand such extreme conditions. And this is how they do it. The lights are actually individual LEDs housed within a resilient silicon strip. These aren't your standard household LEDs. A team of engineers have specifically designed ones to withstand the freezing temperatures. OK, it's more expensive than a conventional light bulb, but it is more eco-friendly. Plus, can you imagine the bill to pay the electricity at this place? Each block of ice is hand-chiselled to create a groove for the LED strip. The blocks are then lined up in a brick wall pattern. The great thing about LEDs is they emit less heat, and what you don't want within an ice block is the block melting. Now, you need to join the bricks together. Traditionally, and especially in your home, you'd use something like cement, but here in Harbin, they use something completely different. Water. I've kept it in my coat to try and keep it liquid. Very simply, pour the water on, and I literally only have a few seconds to get the next brick on top before the water freezes. Now, the idea being that those two then fuse together and it becomes a solid structure. A bit more Harbin cement. Now the moment of truth. Hook some batteries up to my LEDs and, in theory, I'll be able to illuminate this beautiful piece of work. Of course, there's a slightly bigger switch box for the main event. Each individual light is painstakingly turned on by hand, row by row, building by building, and I get to turn on the very last building. So, which switch is it? This one here? Three, two, OK! And there it is, a little bit of Russia in the middle of China. The ice city is developed across an entire year by a team of architects and lasts just three months. 
Mr. Shui Xu Yao is the chief designer. How does it make you feel that everything that you've created here is going to melt? Harbin is following a tradition that has put light at the heart of Chinese celebrations for thousands of years. 750 miles southwest of Harbin is a town that has preserved one of China's most extraordinary ancient light shows. If you want to see a centuries-old slice of China, Nanquan is a good place to start. Its name means warm spring town, and it's called that because it has a geothermal spring which never freezes. Bit of a bonus, really, here in winter when the temperature drops to minus 20 degrees. Because of this, Nanquan has been inhabited for over 20,000 years. Much of what you can see here dates back to the Ming Dynasty and is over 500 years old. But it's not just these magnificent ancient buildings I've come to see. I'm here because Nanquan is a place where some of China's oldest New Year traditions have also been perfectly preserved. And one of the most spectacular, and most dangerous of them, is called Da Su Hua, which basically means creating a canopy of flowers. A canopy of flowers made from flying shards of molten metal. This tradition was started here 500 years ago as a cheap alternative to fireworks by a blacksmith like Mr. Xue. His family have been blacksmiths here in Nuanquan for an incredible 14 generations, and he's the last in a long line of Da Hua masters. Uh, the tradition has been that the art is passed down from fathers to sons, and Mr. Xue has two daughters. Who's next? Who's going to take over from you? Creating a light show out of molten iron is a dangerous business, but Mr. Xue has agreed to show me how it's done. The molten iron has now been cooking for about 45 minutes, and it's looking pretty hot. But before we let any sparks fly, Mr. Xue has to get into some protective clothing. Now, if you think he's going to don a full asbestos suit with some goggles and a helmet, think again. Ready to go in the most flammable protective gear I've ever seen, Mr. Shui gives me my first ever demonstration of Da Su Hua. So that was just a small scale demonstration. So if you want to see the full version, you've got to go inside tonight into the theater. Traditionally, Da Su Hua was performed outside, but the demand is so big today that a specially built venue packs in 1,500 each night. The old city walls have been recreated as throwing molten iron onto those ancient walls was where Mr. Shui's forefathers invented the art. The dancing and singing are just the warm-up before the massive Da Su Hua finale. And now for Mr. Shui's big moment. Protected only by his grandfather's sheepskin and a straw hat, Mr. Shue is the eye of a storm of molten metal. That was amazing. And the effect is beautiful. I know fireworks have come a long way in 500 years, but for me, Da Xu Hua still holds its own. I feel really privileged to have witnessed an ancient tradition performed 
by the last of the Da Suhua masters. Celebrating ancient customs has always been an integral part of the Spring Festival. Even the date of Chinese New Year itself is dictated by an ancient philosophy based on the Chinese zodiac, or as the Chinese call it, Shung Jiao. Chinese New Year falls on a different date each year. According to the lunar calendar, it's dictated by the first new moon closest to the beginning of spring. To help me understand how this works is cultural expert Yang Li Hui. In China, the new year can start from like the middle of January then to the end of February. And this lunar cycle repeats itself every 12 years. One animal represents each year, so totally 12 animals represents 12 years. The animals include the horse, goat, tiger, rooster, dog, pig, and of course, the monkey. I was born in March, 1979. Mm -hmm. okay. What does that make me? Your zodiac animal is the goat. You're well, I eat goat. a lot, so yeah. Yeah. I'm like a goat. Yeah. <laughs> well, that means you are very uh, gentle and oh. uh, very patient. Uh, not, oh, not my wife won't tell me I'm patient. Okay. <laughs> You're very persistent. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on what animal you are, the new year ahead could bring good or bad news. So what will the year of the monkey bring? The monkey year is usually believed to be uh, really good and uh, every people have different uh, ambitions and different dreams will all come true this year. Oh wow, so, so it's a really positive year. Really good year. Life in China is changing fast. But despite all this modernization, at this time of year, people still seem to care about the ancient philosophy of the Chinese zodiac. The animals of the zodiac hold huge symbolism within Chinese culture. In myth, the monkey is perceived as wise and powerful. But in truth, certain species of monkey in China are becoming increasingly rare. In the far southwest of the country, in the mountains of Yunnan province, the locals are working hard to protect this endangered animal. Here there is a magnificent blend of striking landscapes and diverse cultural heritage. Half of China's 55 ethnic minorities call this area home. And high up in the remote Yungling Mountains lies the Baimang Snow Mountain Nature Reserve, home to the iconic snub-nosed monkey. They are one of China's most elusive animals, with only 2,000 of them left in the wild. I'm going to try and find these rare creatures that live far higher than any other monkey on Earth, on mountains that reach 5,000 meters. Sharing the mountainous land up here with the monkeys are the Lisu people. Traditionally a mountain tribe, they are the rangers who take care of these special primates. We've followed the rangers up, it's quite... <laughs> you lose your breath. You suddenly realise how high up you are. You might be able to hear whistling from in the forest. That is some of the rangers from the reserve and every morning they come out here to feed Oh my goodness! <laughs> and I have just seen my very first Yunnan snub-nosed monkey. There's only about two or three thousand of these animals left in the whole of China. <sighs> Mr. Yu has been working at the reserve for over 20 years. He has a unique bond with the monkeys and is responsible for their daily feed. He's now accepted almost as family. But anyone else, like me, has to keep their distance so as not to pass on infections. The reason that they feed these monkeys is to be able to monitor the population 
and that allows the rangers to be able to see how healthy they are and crucially to protect them. The reason that these monkeys' numbers dropped to such critical levels was because they were hunted. There's a lovely story that connects the Lisu with this particular monkey. The legend has it that a small Lisu boy got lost in the forest and couldn't find his way out. And the longer he stayed in the forest, he started to grow hair to keep him warm. And uh, the hairier he got, the more embarrassed he became to go and approach people. And so he stayed in the forest and turned into a snub-nosed monkey. <laughs> There's a very special relationship, I think, between the Lisu people and these monkeys. Since you've been working here, have you seen the population here grow and get healthier? Wow, that's amazing. That's a really good job. Part of the Lisu Ranger's job on the reserve is to monitor the health of these primates, which means collecting their poo at regular intervals. Mr. Yu and his colleagues collect this every day and analyze it. And by doing so, they can tell a lot about the health of the monkeys and also about the population density. But it's not that easy to find. Oh, yeah. oh. Uh, never has a girl been so excited to find a bit of poo. Mr. Yu knows each individual monkey and is able to label up the bags. So you know which monkey did this? That's amazing. The monkey feces are examined in a special study center. One of the purposes of this center is to check the health of the Yunnan snub-nosed monkeys. So, Mr. Yu, what uh, is the scientist testing for? So it's good news. Okay, fantastic. From rare monkeys to giant ice slides. Chinese New Year celebrates the fascinating combination of tradition and innovation that encapsulates modern China today. In our next episode, we explore the importance of family and food on New Year's Eve. Ah, I've got the crimp now. China's most important meal of the year. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you.